Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for um, joining me while I talk about acute asthma. I'm going to just talk about an approach in the emergency department. Uh, first, I'm just going to talk about asthma, the um, pathophysiology, as well as epidemiology, and then move on to the clinical presentation, and then as well as how we manage it within the ED. So asthma, what does it mean? Asthma is derived from the Greek word which signifies panting. As early as 1968, there was a publication which attempted to differentiate asthma more clearly from other pulmonary conditions. Rosens defines asthma as a chronic respiratory disease characterized by periods of variable and recurring symptoms, airflow obstruction, and bronchial hyperresponsiveness that manifests clinically as attacks of impaired breathing. So it is complicated, but let's try and make it easy. There's a complex interaction between the immune system, the environment, the genetic predisposition of the patient, and all these combine to alter airway structure and function and ultimately bring the patient to the emergency department. So why is asthma so important? According to the WHO, more than 339 million people were known, are known with asthma. And in 2016, unfortunately, they, these are old statistics, but in 2016, there were about 417,000 deaths due to asthma at a global level. And asthma is one of the major non-communicable diseases. So let's talk more specifically about South Africa. Asthma prevalence is increasing in both the rural and the urban setting in South Africa. There are multiple factors leading to this increased prevalence, adoption of a Western lifestyle, ATP, obesity, pulmonary infection, um, industrial pollution, cigarette smoking. It is the most common chronic illness in children, therefore a common presentation to the emergency department. And I'd just like to... Uh, draw your attention to the heading over there that despite substantial reductions, asthma deaths in South Africa remain the highest among the world. So lack of appropriate diagnosis, treatment and access to care are barriers to tackling asthma in South Africa. <clears throat> when it comes to pathophysiology, compared with healthy individuals, patients with asthma show bronchial hyperreactivity or hyperresponsiveness, and this is in response to various environmental and infectious stimuli. It can also be in response to allergens, which can be environmental, viral, occupational, or non-allergic stimuli, such as exercise, aspirin-induced, as well as menstrual-related asthma. Um, you get induced bronchoconstriction via release of mediators and metabolic products from infl inflammatory cells, resulting in edema, inflammation, mucus production, and airway smooth muscle hypertrophy, which then all leads to bronchoconstriction, airway obstruction, airflow limitation. And finally, if you have recurrent episodes of airway inflammation, it can result in permanent airway structural remodeling. So is it in our DNA? Some evidence supports that there may be a genetic predisposition for the development of asthma. Studies have identified several chromosomal regions associated with the development of asthma. These chromosomes um, include production of IgE antibodies, expression of airway hyperresponsiveness, as well as the production of inflammatory mediators. And there's also some evidence that has looked at um, prenatal factors such as maternal smoking, uh, use of antibiotics, and then delivery via a cesarean section. So it's always important to remember within the ED uh, that we need to take a targeted focused history while simultaneously assessing and managing the patient. Obviously, if your patient arrives as a status asthmatic, asking them when last they visited their clinic is not your priority at that point. You need to start treating the patient immediately. Um, it's important to remember that asthma can present at any age and is not only a disease of children. Please ask about the onset of coughing, about the classic symptoms, wheezing, breathlessness, uh, chest tightness. Symptoms that could um, lead you to think of asthma are recurrent episodes, worsening at night or early in the morning, and then if they respond appropriate to asthma treatment. 
It's so important to ask patients about their triggers. Um, do they have allergies? Are they smoking? Um, are they taking any other medication? Are they using their inhalers? How often are they using the inhalers? And is their inhaler technique correct? So patients can have a variety of clinical presentations. It's obviously important to look at their heart rate, their respiratory rate, their sats, their blood pressure, do a complete respiratory and cardiovascular exam. And patients with asthma can present with a cough, shortness of breath, wheezing. 80% um, of patients with asthma sometimes have rhinitis, and therefore it's important to ask about the upper respiratory tract as well as examining the upper respiratory tract. Please just remember that all that wheezes is not asthma. It's important to remember your differentials when thinking about a patient who is wheezing. When we consider our differentials, uh, I've broken it down into cardiac, pulmonary, your upper airway, and systemic causes. So cardiac causes anything such as valvular heart disease, congestive card heart failure, we call it like a cardiac wheeze. Pulmonary um, problems such as COPD exacerbation, which is quite similar to asthma. Pneumonia, uh, COVID, TB, if they have a pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, cystic fibrosis, if they've had inhalation or burns. Your upper airway can obviously present with stridor, but you can have wheezing as well. Laryngeal um, from laryngeal edema, uh, laryngeal neoplasm or a foreign body, which is quite important in our pediatric population. And then systemic causes, which can cause a wheeze as well. So um, anaphylaxis, any sort of medication or reflux. So asthma, it's always important to have a systematic approach so that we don't um, miss anything. So in with anything in the emergency department, we always love to do our A, B, C, D, and E, and I think um, asthma should be no exception. So airway, uh, start with airway and check that the airway is opened and maintained. You may need to just do some basic maneuvers or add some adjuncts. Check for stridor at the same time. And have a look, is there any evidence of angioedema? So are you dealing with an anaphylaxis rather than just a pure bronchospasm from an asthma exacerbation? Breathing, please count the respiratory rate for all of your patients. Check their oxygen saturation. Look, listen to the chest. Give, start giving oxygen by nasal prongs, a venturi or a non-rebreather, depending on the oxygen saturation and their work of breathing. Consider is the patient distressed or not? Are they using their accessory muscles? Is there wheezing? Do they have a silent chest? Are they moving any air? And start administering your beta-2 agonists and your anticholinergic. In circulation, please check the blood pressure, feel the patient's pulses, check for cap refill, replace IV fluids as needed. Consider is this patient hemodynamically unstable and is there evidence of status asthmaticus? Finally, assess their disability. Please, an app in children or GCS, depending on the age, check your glucose, and then always expose your patient. Again, looking for things like anaphylaxis, do they have a rash? Um, is their temperature raised? So this is just a, like a simplified diagram to try and look at the severity of the asthma, depending on the patient's clinical, um, their vital signs. It's not a hard and fast rule. Please always use your clinical judgment when deciding if a patient is mild, moderate, or severe. But if we're considering someone who is mild, their heart rate would usually be less than 100, their SATs would be more than 95, and their peak flow would be more than 75% of expected. <clears throat> uh, in a moderate exacerbation, their heart rate would be between 100 and 120, their SATs would be on the lower side between 90 and 95, but their PACO2 would still be less than 42, and their peak flow would be about 50 to 75%. You're considering someone to be severe or life-threatening and extremist, they would usually have a tachycardia of more than 120 or a bradycardia. Please do not think a bradycardia is normal. It's usually an impending sign of um, respiratory arrest and then cardiac arrest. Their SATs would usually be less than 90%, their PaO2 would be less than 60, and they would be retaining CO2 at that point and be more than 42. Their peak flow would be less than 50, or they would actually be unable to perform a peak flow because of the severity. 
I came across a different um, scoring assessment when I was doing my presentation. It's called the Pediatric Respiratory Assessment Measure, or PRAM. And it assesses the severity of acute asthma, and you can use it in the group. It's been validated between the ages of 3 to 17 years. And it essentially looks at a few things to uh, then grade it as mild, moderate, or severe. So your oxygen saturation, are they using accessory muscles, so suprasternal retraction, scalene muscle contraction? Their entry, is it normal, is it decreased? And then their wheezing. And then you can add up the score and it gives you whether it's um, mild, moderate, or severe. Please just always remember to use your clinical judgment as well. Don't just rely on a scoring system. Then within the ED, we should also be um, using a peak flow meter and having a looking at peak expiratory flow. So a peak flow is a measurement uh, to see the air that's flowing out of the lungs. Peak flow measurement can show the amount and rate of air that can be forcibly, forcefully breathed out of the lungs. And it should be started after a full lung inhalation. And then we know that during asthma, airflow out of the lungs is restricted, and therefore there's a decrease in your peak expiratory flow. So what you would do is you'd uh, find the patient's um, a, a height in men and in women, and then you would uh, have a look at the graph and plot what you expect their peak expiratory flow to be. So it's important to also remember the peak expiratory flow can be used when the patient um, presents the ED to have a look at the severity. And then once you've started your, um, implemented your treatments, then you can repeat your peak flow as well. So if we start to have a look at the treatment, um, again, we treat it according to the severity. So all patients must get a beta-2 agonist such as salbutamol um, added with that um, your anticholinergic such as apotropium, and you can start that immediately when you're assessing the patient. Then if they're a mild patient, please give them steroids as well. So prednisone orally 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. If they're moderate and you're worried that they can't uh, tolerate um, swallowing a tablet, then you can consider hydrocort 200 milligrams IV. And then if they're a severe patient, you want to give them steroids, give them mag self, and if they're in extremis, um, adrenaline, but I'll talk about status a little bit later. So if we look specifically at our treatment, so your beta-2 agonist, your salbutamol, please administer your beta-2 agonist immediately. It's preferable to administer it via an NDI. Um, it has been shown to be more effective, and also um, during our peak COVID waves, we want as least aerialization procedures as possible. So please use the MDI. And if they're not tolerating it or um, you want continuous, then you can use nebulization. This just uh, has a nice um, breakdown of the dosing. Um, I'll make this available to everyone so you can remember it. So in adults, um, two puffs of your salbutamol or one to four puffs of your ipotropium. In peds, you can also give two puffs of your salbutamol. And then if they're less than five, it's two puffs of your ipotropium. And between five and 12, it's four puffs. Then salbutamol nebs, it's 2.5 to 5 milligrams in your adults with 500 max of ipotropium. And then in your pediatric population, if they're between 20 months to five years, it's 2.5 milligrams. Between six to 12 years, it's 2.5 to five milligrams. And your ipotropium, less than five years, would be 250 max. And between five to 12 years, 250 to 500. This is a consideration in your children and even your smaller, um, like your infants. They generally, using an inhaler is difficult and you need to have quite good coordination. So uh, please always encourage the use of spaces in children, uh, which allows the correct delivery of the MDI into the lungs. And then in your younger infants, please also use a mask as well when giving the MDI. So we also add an anticholinergic, and in this case, it's hypertropium bromide. Um, and they have a synergistic effect um, and should be used in moderate to severe asthma, and please don't ever use them alone. Everyone gets steroids in an acute exacerbation of asthma. 
So we can give prednisone uh, 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram. You can also consider dexamethasone 0.6 milligrams per kilogram IV or IM. Um, and then if you're going to, if you worry the patient's very severe and um, is status, you can give an IV and in adults that would be hydrocortisone 200 milligrams IV and in pediatrics, uh, five milligrams per kilogram to a max of 200 milligrams IV. So obviously um, patients uh, with severe asthma and tend to be hypoxic, so please give them some oxygen. You don't need to give oxygen in mild asthma attacks, um, only administer it if necessary, and you want to aim for SATs of more than 90%. Usually, uh, if we're not using the MDI and we are using um, the nebulizer, the nebulizer sometimes doesn't give you um, enough um, oxygen. So what you can do in a patient that's very distressed and you are struggling with their SATs, you can give them a nebulizer and then use the nasal prongs um, simultaneously at the same time. So almost doing dual O2. <clears throat> so in terms of, sorry, excuse me. In terms of investigating um, your patient, there's just a couple of things that you can consider. So I spoke about peak flow to measure the lung function and to assess the responsiveness to treatment. You can also do an arterial blood gas. <clears throat> this is in your more severe patients. Initially, they will have a respiratory alkalosis because they tachypneic. They'll be blowing off um, their CO2. But as that bronchoconstriction worsens and the patient begins to tire, they then um, retain CO2 and they, they end up having a respiratory acidosis. Please also consider doing a chest X-ray um, the patient can be hyperinflated, they can be infiltrates, which may represent um, an underlying low respiratory tract infection, and patients with asthma can also um, have a pneumothorax, so it's important to consider that and look for it. So if we've given our NEBs, we've given our steroids, we've maybe also given MagSalf, and this patient is working in front of you, they are becoming more and more distressed um, and they're not responding to our treatment, we then consider this severe life-threatening asthma or status asthmaticus. Um, it's considered a medical emergency and results in hypoxemia, hypercarbia, respiratory failure, and ultimately will lead to a cardiac arrest. So please give magnesium sulfate to the severe patients. So the adult dose is two grams IVI, usually in a 100 or 200 mole normal saline bag given over 15 minutes. The pediatric dose would be 50 milligrams per kilogram IVI, maximum of two grams, also given over 15 minutes. Um, just be careful, magnesium um, can also drop your blood pressure. So make sure that you are monitoring the patient appropriately. Then if we... Considering status asthmaticus, please uh, give adrenaline. So in adults, you can use 0.3 milligrams IMI stat. In the pediatrics, uh, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram to a max of 0.3 milligrams of the one in 1,000. You can also, if, you've, if the patient is severe and you've landed up intubating them and you cannot break that bronchospasm, you can also consider an adrenaline infusion. So it's a very, very low dose adrenaline infusion and it's to try and help bronchodilate and it's 0 0.05 mics per kilo per minute. You would usually, um, you can mix it according to the normal protocol. So 12 amps of the one in 1000 in the 200 ml bag and then just calculate it to be 0 0.05 mics per kilo per minute. There is also um, a consideration for IV salbutamol as a 250 max or four max per kilo slow IV bolus. So if we've um, given all of our adjuncts, we've given adrenaline, our patient is not improving, we can also consider um, whether the patient might benefit from a trial of NIV. Please, it's just to be careful when using NIV with asthma, you must know how to use your settings and when to then make the decision to intubate as well. 
So um, if you've got a cooperative patient, please explain to the patient uh, about NIV. Uh, NIV is not comfortable. It's a very tight fitting mask that fits over the nose as well as the mouth. I usually explain to my patients that it feels like you driving at 120 on the highway and you stick your head out the window and that air that's blowing in you, that's what blowing at you, that's what NIV feels like. So please counsel them appropriately before just putting a mask over their face. Um, so you're going to start, um, when you're doing your settings, please start low as well. Don't um, crank up the pressure support straight away to eight when you put them on <clears throat> NIV as it is uncomfortable and they need to slowly get used to it and learn to breathe with the machine. So um, start with low peeps, so like three, um, start with a pressure support. I usually start with like two or three and then I increase it um, to the tidal volumes that I want to see and the, the patient responsiveness. Please also uh, continue in nine nebs with your NIV and most with our um, ventilators, most of them can also do inline nebulization at the same time. If you have an agitated patient, you can um, try and give them some ketamine um, to calm them and sedate them and then try NIV as well. Please, that patient needs to be monitored really, really closely. Please do not give someone ketamine, put them on NIV and then walk away. NIV, you are not protecting that patient's airway. They are at risk for vomiting and aspiration. You can insufflate the stomach. So please, uh, be if you are so concerned that your patient is agitated, that you're giving ketamine and wanting to NIV them, it's probably better to consider um, intubating this patient. So patients with severe asthma and status asthmaticus, unfortunately, sometimes you have to consider intubating them. Uh, obviously, it's not the first thing you want to jump to, but once you've done all your adjuncts, if they have progressive fatigue, worsening respiratory failure, they've got deterioration of their mental status, um, their work of breathing is, has increased dramatically, it hasn't responded, or they've gone into a cardiac arrest, then you may need to intubate this patient. It's important to um, maximize your pre-oxygenation. So um, that can be done with NIV prior to intubation, it's a good uh, technique to help pre-oxygenate the patient. Try and optimize your first pass success. You don't want to be struggling with this patient's airway. Um, induce the patient when they are upright and try and intubate them upright if you can. Please use the largest ET um, endotracheal tube possible because you're going to need to be blowing out as much of the, the air that they have trapped inside. So you want to use a large tube. There's a lot of airway resistance. And when you are, if you are going to be manually pre-oxygenating the patient with the bag, please don't aggressively uh, bag mask ventilate this patient. They are bronchoconstricting. So everything that you're blowing in, they are struggling to blow out of their lungs. So um, please just ventilate them very, very carefully. In consideration for your um, RSI meds, ketamine is great. Um, it's cardiac stable. It's also um, got some evidence for bronchodilation, so it's got a dual effect. And then depending on what you feel comfortable with, um, but you can use rocuronium 1.2 milligrams per kg, or you can use succinylcholine. Um, then in terms of your ventilator settings, um, we usually like to use a volume control setting when it comes to um, asthma. We like a low rate, even though they've, um, got hypercarbia and they're retaining their CO2 and you want to blow it off, trying to get an asthma patient to breathe at a fart rate is not really how you're going to get to your end goals. So you need a low, slow rate, which gives them time to blow off the CO2. You want a low tidal volume as well. Um, this um, publication said seven milligrams per kilogram. You can go even a little bit lower and then increase it as, you, um, as the patient improves. And then you want low peeps. The patients have um, almost high intrinsic peaks because they've got stacking within the alveoli. So you want low peeps. So about two, almost three. And then you want to increase your IE ratio because of the pathophysiology of asthma, you're getting bronchoconstriction. So you're able to get that air in, but you're not able to get the air out. So you want that patient to have time to um, expire. So you can increase your IE ratio um, one to five. Then um, remember that you want your goal plateau pressure to be less than 30. So if you just go back to the 
physiology and the physics of ventilation. So your airway pressures is your flow times your resistance um, plus your alveolar pressure. So in, um, in uh, asthma, your peak inspiratory pressure is high because the ventilator is pushing against that airway resistance from all the bronchoconstriction. But usually your alveolar pressures are okay, but you need to check them. And the way you do that on the vent is you do an inspiratory hold, which shows you your plateau pressures, which should be less than 30. Um, then please just a consideration um, of um, asthma and cardiac arrest. So if your patient um, crashes when they're on the vent, please consider that they could have a tension pneumothorax. If you've been bad mass ventilating them too aggressively, or even if they've been on the vent, they can have um, developed tension. So please look for it, please consider it. And if they're in cardiac arrest, do bilateral finger thoracostomies. As again, I said, please ventilate with caution. Um, if you're increasing all that um, the pressure within the lungs, you're decreasing venous return, you're worsening your cardiac arrest. Also is a consideration for manual chest deflation. So um, disconnecting your ET tube and then manually pressing on that chest to try and get all that um, trapped air out. And then post intubation, if they do crash, just check your ET tube as well. Have you, is it in the correct place? You haven't intubated the esophagus, check that you haven't intubated the right main brain, right main um, bronchus. Um, so look, is it kinked? Um, obviously go through your dopes as well. Then if we obviously haven't intubated and um, on ventilating our patients, if they're not, how do we know when we can safely dis discharge patients from the ED who have had a mild or moderate um, um, asthma attack? So we can discharge safely if you've got a heart rate usually less than 100 or a spirit rate less than 25. Your stats are more than 90%, 92% on room air. If they've improved up substantially to your therapy and it's a sustained effect, so it's been about more than an hour past after the last nebulization. Also to do a peak flow again, if it's more than 75% of the patients best or predicted, then that's a good response. And then you can also ask if the patient's feeling better, but that is the poorest sign for discharge. And then just work on your clinical judgment. If you have any concern, rather consult medicine and uh, let them admit the patient. If you are seeing the patient home, please just check their inhaler technique, educate them regarding their triggers, and then ensure that they have appropriate follow-up. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.